gentleman whose father passes away, unfortunately. And he lives in Pittsburgh, and he belongs to a synagogue, but he belongs to a synagogue in the very nominal way he belongs to a synagogue, like going a couple times a year and that's it. And his father passed away, and his father lives in Baltimore. And so he goes home to Baltimore for the funeral, and for Shiva for the few days after, for the morning period immediately after. And then he goes back home and decides that he wants to say Kaddish. He wants to say the daily prayer that traditionally said in Judaism when somebody with it, like when a father or other close relative passes away. Um, and he wants to do it for a month. Jewish, there is a poor form of Jewish tradition. You do it for, some people want to do it for months. So he says, I want to say this daily prayer for a month. And so he goes to his synagogue and he says, would you, I have a problem. I want to say this Kaddish prayer for a month. But I can't because the time that the synagogue has for praying is too late because I got to go to work, right? And so would you please move your davening time earlier for me? Okay, this is his synagogue, but he never goes, right? He goes for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, that's it. What does the rabbi say? Yes or no? No, right? Right, the rabbi says, no, we're not going to move step. And beyond that, you should come early, you know, you should come late. It's more important to be here than to go to work because it's your father, but it gives a whole guilt trip, the whole thing. And so what does he do? He goes to his office and he gets online and he starts IMing with a friend of his in Los Angeles. A friend of his, by the way, who knew his father, who he grew up with, one of his close friends from high school. And he's lamenting the fact that the synagogue won't accommodate him. And his friend throws out a really interesting question. He says, well, why don't we just do it? What do you mean just do it? He says, well, why don't we just daven? Why don't we just create it? And they proceed to gather a group of people around the country who know this man, who were friends with him when he was a kid, who knew his father. Do they geographically live in Pittsburgh? No. They do it all online. They do it all through Skype. And they create an online praying moment for him for, to help him in his morning. Okay, so we could have a long conversation if we wanted about whether it's halakhically appropriate to daven via Skype. But, okay, put all that aside. The real question is, who is this guy's community? Is his community the people that he happens to live with, the synagogue that he happens to belong to? Or is community the people that he's friends with, the people that he's connected to in his gut, the people that he goes to when he's in mourning? So what we're gonna talk about today is that very question um, of how emerging technologies, new media, changes the entire definition of what community is and elevates to, opens up possibilities of how we interact with each other, how we communicate with each other, uh, to, to, and how the Jewish world can be responsive to that. I gotta say, this is a really cool conversation to be having. It's a cool conversation to be having for a number of reasons. Number one is, um, it's just fun stuff. <laughs> I gotta admit it, it's just fun stuff. Um, number two is, I've been a fan of N10 for a long time and have gone to this conference for a number of years and remember that meeting with Lisa Colton several years ago, we're like, wow, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, it was like three years ago, two years ago. <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if we could gather a group of people in the Jewish community to ask the same question all these other people are asking. And we gathered together over lunch informally, right? It was like six or seven people. It was like, oh, wouldn't it be great? And now we're at a place where, you know, more people will be filtering here. We have like 60 people who are saying, gee, I want to ask this question. I want to be part of that conversation, right? Total game changer, which is really exciting. Um, it's also really exciting to me because we have a great partner. And we have a great partner from the Schusterman Family Foundation in Darim Online and, and in Lisa, um, who is a, uh, a tremendous professional and a great colleague and who I want to publicly thank for making all this happen because it would not have happened without you. So thank you very much. And I also want to acknowledge Robin Cantor who's standing in the back who's the uh, communications officer at the Schusterman Family Foundation where I work um, who has also made it possible for us to be here. I get to stand in front but she did all the work. <laughs> um, so, so this is what we're going to do today. I, I'm going to, you, you see the uh, program, right? Everybody got one of these? Yes? Yes? Is the point where you say yes? No. Yes. No. Aha. Great. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. Um, and we've tried to craft a conversation that goes from both the very specific problem solving, how do you actually wrestle with the issues that you have, as well as very high level, strategic big picture stuff. And we're going to do a little bit of going back and forth, um, but the guiding principle of this is you should be able to walk away with new learnings, new gleanings, and new relationships that actually take you and help you to be able to solve the problems that you might face or the opportunities that you see in front of you. Okay? I'm going to, everybody got one? 
Yes? Um, you may have noticed these cameras floating about. Uh, if you do not feel comfortable being filmed and you are asked a question on camera, just say, please, I don't want to be filmed. And if you could just flag for either Lisa or Robin or myself, if you want to be removed from video as we um, edit this stuff down in the future, please just let us know and we'll take care of that for you, okay? Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so, um, so my charge for a little bit is to give a little bit of the state of the, sort of the state of the Jewish digital world. Uh, a, a big piece of that for us is the Jewish New Media Innovation Fund. So I'm gonna talk for a couple minutes about what the New Media Innovation Fund is, as well as what it's taught us, and then sort of present from my vantage point at the Schusterman Foundation um, where we are. Like, so where, where is it as a Jewish world we are? It's sort of a daunting task to present that big picture, so I will do my best to present the good stuff, the not so good stuff, um, and we'll see where we go. Okay, anybody have any questions? Are we all together, yes? We're a little tired this morning. Are we a little tired this morning? Yes. We feel a little tired this morning. Jane's not tired, she's like awake. So there's coffee, so I will not be offended if you stand up and get coffee along the way, don't worry. Okay, so um, the Jewish New Media Innovation Fund. So in, I think it was late summer, we partnered with two other foundations, the Jim Joseph Foundation and the Righteous Persons Foundation, an effort actually driven by Righteous Persons to create and ask a question about um, what would happen if we put out this competitive grant pool. The rationale for doing this was actually not as much about what would happen around competition or around grant ideas, as much it was we as foundations knew we wanted to invest the space, but didn't know the right questions to be asking, didn't know the right process, didn't know the right people to go to. So we say, you know what, if we put this out there, we'll get about 100 people probably, our estimate was 100 to 125 applications. Um, to put, and we pulled together some money and said, all right, we've got a half a million dollars, and what do you know, um, not only did we get 100 applications, we got 300 applications. Uh, they were from all over the world. Um, interestingly, we opened it up to not just non-for-profit organizations, but also for-profits and individuals. Um, anybody want to guess what percentage was not-profit? What percentage was not for-profit? 30%. 30% not-for-profit? 60%. All right, we're all over the place. This is good. I like it. So 60%. Who said 60%? You win something. Congratulations. You read it. You read it somewhere. Cheated. Cheated. Um, so 60% were not-for-profits, and the rest were basically roughly split, a little bit more individuals than, not, than for-profits. What a great realization, right, that the normal structures that we have in Jewish life to create Jewish life may not be the structures that are going to create Jewish life in the future. We had 305 applications, they were incredible. We still, we um, engaged in a company called Blueprint Research and Design. Um, Lucy Bernholtz is the principal of that firm who helped us through the, how to create the competitive part of it, the, uh, the pool, as well as processing all the applications and whatnot. And what did we end up with? Um, so criteria, this is, this is a really interesting thing. We as a group articulated nine criteria. We put these uh, online as part of the application process. I will tell you of all the learnings, the number of people who commented with great appreciation that we, they knew exactly how they were gonna be evaluated. And I will tell you what we did. We took these nine things and we articulated a point value for each of them at varying degrees. I think it was like a one through four scale, a one through five scale, depending on which one it was. And, um, and then weighted the nine of them based on, as a foundation, what were our greatest, highest priorities. So the two that are yellow, the innovation and the cont contribution to more vibrant, meaningful Jewish life, were weighted the most, but all of them had some significant weight. And then we, um, and all the, by the way, all the slides will be available on the Schusterman Foundation website, and I assume we can put them on during as well, and, uh, by the end of the day. So you can write down, but you don't have to write down. Um, and then we engaged 75 readers. Every application was read by three different people. Those 75 readers took all nine of those criteria for all of those applications and created this massive, massive Excel document with all 300 things with all these points, all right? Does that make sense where we are? Everybody with me? Yes, process-wise, okay. And then we took the top 30 or so, um, and there's a little demographic switch, a little bit of, gosh, you know, we have four proposals that are sort of similar, let's put, let's find the one, you know, let's wait. It wasn't perfect science at 30 we stopped. We did a basically the top 30 with a couple little adjustments and then gave them to a pool of six experts. And the folks who are up there, um, you can see who they are. And these are experts in um, new media as well as in Jewish life and Jewish and education writ large. And I'm happy to talk about any of those people. Um, uh, there are some incredible, incredible people, and the fact that we actually got those six folks to ask this question and to focus on it, again, is one of the greatest successes of this project. And from there, we identified uh, the nine recipients, and we're very um, excited by this group of participants, group of grant recipients. 
They are big organizations, small organizations, for-profit, not-for-profit, represented in this room, not represented in this room. We have a number of them here, which is great. Um, and they really test the boundaries on, uh, on what can be. Some of these projects, um, are, I don't know if they're gonna work. Like, we really don't know if some of them are gonna work, and that's okay. The degree of proof of concept to get funding for this was lower than in other projects. Um, so we can talk about the, the specifics. I think that's sort of a less interesting conversation for this group. I'm happy to answer those questions if people have questions about the specific proposals. Um, what's greater for me is sort of the learnings that we gained as funders and as for the Jewish community as a whole uh, from the process. So that's where I'm gonna go. Assuming that's okay with everybody. Yes, yes. Hey kids, yes, no, yes? Yes, thank you. Yes. No, we're tired. Okay, so here we go. Um, what I'm about to share, there's absolutely no data to back this up. Zero data. Well, I put it there, but I think the way people usually frame it is with a guilt, ugh, I don't know what to do, I wanna do more, I don't know what to do. Some of those organizations are here in this room, we won't name you, but some of those organizations are represented by folks in this room. And then there's this slice at the end who totally get it. And what I mean by get it is understand the power of emerging technologies, new media, to transform how we define community, to transform how we communicate, to utterly put on its head the concept of what my community means and how I interact with other people. That is not an easy thing to do. That requires culture change. That requires an embracement of networks as opposed to membership. That requires understanding that just because people don't affiliate with an institution under a formal institutional head does not mean they're not affiliating with each other and they don't have strong Jewish social circles. Much on the negative, I'm gonna start with what's not so great about what I see in this landscape today. Um, and this is based a lot on those reading through 305 applications to the Jewish New Media Innovation Fund, um, as well as other work that we do. First. A website's not innovative. I can't tell you, it was so sad. The number of people who applied who said, we don't have a website, so we're gonna build a website so that people will know what we do. Shockingly large number of those type of applications. Very, very sad. That is not innovation. That's one-way communication. That is, um, um, like that's just a necessary to even be in the game, let alone actually be advancing the ball. And I share it here. I, I was sort of reluctant to even put the point, put the bullet on the slide because it's so obvious to a group in this room who would actually sign up for this. It's still out there. There's a lot of people, not just the people who have their heads in the sand, but people who say, oh, I'm so excited, I'll put a website, and then people will come flocking. It just doesn't work that way anymore. Number one negative. I'm sorry, everybody's faces got sad when they saw this slide. <laughs> okay, number two. How do I use Facebook better is the wrong question. When we focus on a tactic and think that that tactic is representative of an entire strategy and organization change, we're missing the boat. And there are a lot of people who are still asking this question, oh, if only I was tweeting on a regular basis, then blah, 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 all these things were gonna happen. As opposed to thinking about how do I build a comprehensive strategy around using the tools that exist today, how do I stack correctly? How do I organize correctly? What's my communication protocols? What are my, you know, what are the risks that I have to take? All those different pieces that come into play, not just how do I use the tactic of, for example, Facebook. The Jewish world is still fairly um, low on its realm of risk tolerance, and this stuff is risky. What's interesting to me is looking at, um, the size of his institution, and we haven't had a chance to really dive into this data, there'll be some more concrete data analysis that happens from the applications, but who is it that's willing to take risk in the Jewish world today? Um, tends to be smaller shops, tends to be newer shops, or places that are really, really struggling, who basically have said, you know what, I got nothing to lose, so let's go for it. And what we're talking about, about opening the doors to communication in a different way, about uh, creating environments where people can play and create and you as an organization don't necessarily have control over it, that's very risky. I think we often conflate, I think it's the right word, or get confused by the difference between sort of a knowledge base about content and technological expertise. And we assume that because we are a really great educator about Israel, for example, 
that we therefore will be able to be a really great educator about Israel in a technological way and know how to use those tools, etc. And there really is a skill set in that space. There really is a skill set that, um, that, that there are experts out. And I think one of the thing that, things that N10 has really done incredibly well is elevate the field of experts on using technology to, for social change in nonprofit organizations. And the fact that we're able to do this conversation in conjunction with NTC is really, uh, to me, is a sign of us getting on the bandwagon of elevating that conversation. I think we still have this very naive understanding of staff capacity and budget capacity. I just, the number of proposals were said, well, we'll spend $3,000 and we'll um, redo our website and our entire communication strategy with it. it. just, we are far, far from having a real good, strong sense of what it actually takes to do this. This costs money. This costs time. Uh, which I think everybody here knows, or you wouldn't be here trying to ask this question, and it probably costs more time and more money than you imagine. If you're thinking about this, though, as, all right, so I have my entire organizational structure, let me allocate one person to do that techie thing, then you're going to underestimate the impact, uh, the, the costs. If, on the other hand, you say, we as an organization want to communicate in a completely different way, top to bottom, everything we do, how often are we asking people for their opinions on things? How do we integrate those opinions into what we do? How do we follow up with people? How do we have two-way communications? How do, at that point, it's no longer, well, how much money do I allocate for my website? And it's no longer as, it doesn't feel as expensive anymore because it's an entire organizational shift. Does this make sense? Yes? Okay, great. Okay. All right, there's good, though. I couldn't only say, I focus on the bad. The good stuff, there's some really great things out there. First of all, the potential is huge. Potential is just dramatic for what we're able to do. If we could get right front-end communication, there's lots of examples, many of them in this room, about how to do front-end communication that's two-way, that's responsive, that listens, that's aware. It's, think about the potential, that's huge. Then the back-end, the ability to use data in a more effective way, in a more powerful way on your back-end and integrate that data with your front-end um, communications, the, the tools exist for huge, huge opportunities. I'll give you a great example of missed opportunities, okay? Um, my wife is friends on Facebook with all of the other parents of the kids in my daughter's preschool. And about a month ago, she said, I bet Ariella, my daughter, I bet Ariella is going to be sick by the end of the week. So like on a Monday or Tuesday. Ariella is going to be sick by the end of the week. Why did Lori know that Ariella was going to be sick by the end of the week? <laughs> status up, status up, oh, so-and-so is sick, so-and-so is sick. Not just the kids in Ariella's class, right? But the kids, the siblings of the kids in Ariella's class. <laughs> It's like this great epidemiological study waiting to happen of how Facebook can track. And what do you know? By the end of the week, I was at the doctor with Ariella. She had strep throat and fever and blah, 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 right? To me, what if the school was watching? What would they have done differently? If the school is watching and noticing that 80% of the families of kids in her class were sick, what would they have done differently? They would have communicated completely differently with the parents, right? hand washing, if your kid shows any signs, please don't come to school. There's all these things, right? And this, now I'm talking about one tiny example of one piece in which if the, community, the school was watching carefully and participating in that community of conversation that was being created online, they would have responded differently and would have improved the educational environment because you know what? By the end of the week, half the class was out sick. Make sense? Yes? Okay, cool. The Schusterman Family Foundation has been thinking about a question for about nine months and we'll be continuing to wrestle with it moving forward of how do we actually put what is frequently siloed investments that we make and how we put those in conversation with each other. How do we actually integrate the experiences so that when you are moved through life stages, those experiences are consistent with each other intellectually and emotionally, interpersonally. And I think the, the tools of new media can be very powerful in helping us do so. What if we have data that talks to each other? What if my output becomes your input? And we are able to leverage, it? and I would say 10 years ago, we couldn't have that conversation. So I'll flag, at the risk of flagging one amongst others, because they're all great, Sasha Littman's here for Measuring Success, one of the recipients of the New Media Innovation Fund grants, to try to do this, to try to actually pilot data from different organizations communicating with each other, talking with each other, and improving the user experience because of it. That potential is huge. That's, talk, that's game changer. If we can get that right, that's game changer in the Jewish world. And there's some excellent models. One of the things I'm really excited about today is your opportunity to hear from a variety of different models, and you're gonna hear some people who like, work on the ground with 
um, with practitioners, with frontline people who are using technology in completely different ways than the way we've been used to using technology, and we'll be able to, um, and are leveraging it, and leveraging it powerfully. And so I hope that throughout this experience you're able to glean various pieces. Um, look, I, there's a, lot of, or, there's a lot of things that are gonna happen in the next five years. I have no idea exactly what they are, but I'm very excited. We are very, very optimistic about what that looks like. First of all, you should know what's gonna happen within fund. Uh, we don't exactly know what's gonna happen within the Media Innovation Fund. We are still sort of reeling from the fact that there were 300, not 100, right? So, and the conversations we've been hearing about organizations that are getting funding for their idea anyway, despite the fact that they weren't one of nine out of 300, um, are really inspiring to us, that people have shifted their organizations around this. The way people asked amongst their constituents for ideas about how to build these projects is really inspiring to us. So there's a lot of good gleanings, and uh, we're in the process now of actually doing some analysis of all those applications, and we'll be publishing some report of some sort in some easily identifiable way, um, you'll be sure to know about it, that says, here's what we've learned some more than some of the stuff that I've related, but also things that other people have commented on. These are my favorites, but everybody has their own. Um, and then, w I don't know if this is gonna happen again. Version 2.0, right, we've gone back and forth. I, you know, we've not, none of the foundations have brought it to their boards yet to see if we can do this again. There's a lot of interest, that's a good thing, so we'll see. So I can't tell you, it tends to be the question people ask, particularly if they didn't get the fund as well, there'll be another chance. <laughs> And I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure yet. I've talked about this a couple times. The, um, <clears throat> people are communicating in a different way today. And the question is, will the Jewish community respond to that or not respond to that? This is different than trying to move people. Okay, does this make sense, right? One thing the Jewish community and so all social change organizations try to do is take individuals in one place and move them to another place. That's not what this is about. This is about being responsive to where people are, the way they communicate, the way they talk to each other, which is not a rejection. It is not a rejection of organizing. It is not a rejection of the minion, like the sense that you need more than just myself alone. It's just defining the boundaries of that minion in a very, very different way. So find the boundaries of that community in a different way. And, um, and I'm really excited about what that can look like. We have seen countless examples of organizations that have made these shifts. And you'll hear about those specifics today. Um, they are not easy shifts to make, but people are starting to appreciate it and starting to get it. And I think the tension between institution and sort of top-down institution and bottom-up institution are playing out in really beautiful ways um, across the country, for-profit and not-for-profit. And we in the Jewish community are learning a lot from them. And I would just say the last piece for me is what your role is with it. Um, I think that the more champions we have in Jewish life saying, no, wait, that's not the right way to do it. No, wait, you think you know what your community thinks, but have you actually asked your community what they think? The more people who are saying that on their local organizations and on national organizations, um, the, the more successful we're gonna be at actually making this kind of change happen. And I'm very optimistic about it. So um, what I'd like to do is, I know we're over. Did did our guest arrive? I've not seen our guest. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, um, this is what I love to do. We're gonna have some time for conversation as we go, uh, and I'll be here for some time. I'm not gonna take questions right now, or comments, so if that's okay with everybody, unless we have something really burning. No, okay, good. Yeah? You sure, because I want you does anybody have questions? We, I have five minutes, I've been told. Yes. Well, hold on. Please, because of our, our pardon me, yeah. and an effort to try to build this sense of this community within, if you can identify who you are, that would be very helpful. Uh, Scott Harris, you can first form to do what, My question is, what happens to all of these other proposals that didn't get picked? How do we not lose the Great question. Ideas? Great question. So I'd say a couple of things. One, I don't know the answer to the question yet. <laughs> we don't know. And we're talking about it and trying to figure out the right way to do it. Um, we ne None of the foundations and on our contract with Blueprint, we never built capacity for that. Like we never, in all the scenarios that we thought about, we actually, in all candor, like we never thought, oh wait, there are going to be other good proposals. There were a lot of really, really good proposals. This is not an easy process. What do we do about all of them? We don't know the answer to that question. Um, there's a couple of ideas that have been floated, one of which is to... Um, 
uh, one of which is just to put them all out there, put all the ideas online, and let everybody have at them and learn from them. Um, there's some confidentiality issues in which, as we floated that, some of the applicants have asked us not to do so. So how do you manage it? Like, so that requires a level of communication with all of those applicants to figure out who's willing and who's not willing. So we're going down that road. Um, there's also, we have all the comments from, you know, every application got read by three experts, right? So <coughs> that's a knowledge base, a feedback. Again, it was done with a sense that it wasn't going to be distributed publicly. The demand for that is much higher than what we expected. And so we're in this interesting dance of just our instinct as, was like, just give the information, right? Information's free, let it flow. That's the lesson that we should learn. But that's counterintuitive for a lot of people. So we're, I, I, my guess is over the next month or so, we're gonna figure out mechanisms to share that, um, share those results as well as share those ideas more broadly. And I would say the third is, um, part of that gleanings that we'll share that I referenced in the private slide is gonna be trends, right? So there were a certain number of geolocation applications, which I found particularly interesting to look at, none of which got funded, by the way, for a variety of reasons. Geolocation, you guys know geolocation, right? right? So based on where I am geographically, what Jewish experiences are near me, sort of the four squared gone Jewish type of concept. Um, so what do we learn from that category of ideas? What about games, right? So well, there's a whole bunch of game applications. What do we learn from the games and the interactive game stuff that's out there? So I think there's gonna be sort of those swaths that people can learn from. Yes. Um, Brenda, who are you? Um, Brenda Gabbard from the Jewish Communal Service Association. I'm curious to know if you saw a qualitative difference between the applicants that were for-profit and the not-for-profits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's a great question. The for-profit applications tended to have a much better sense of how much money it was going to cost to do what they were going to do. They had a much, much better sense of measuring what they were going to do, like dramatically better sense in terms of their ability to measure what they were going to do. Uh, they tended to... Um, as you might expect, their, their ability to articulate the impact on Jewish life was weaker. And so one of, the real, one of the lessons for us is we ask sort of this pocket, this pocket, this pocket to apply for an idea, and one of the concepts is maybe that's the wrong way to do it. Maybe what we need to be doing is creating teams of people who have different skills and saying, okay, you team of people with different skills that will help steward that relationship or let people, right? What if there was sort of a matchmaking approach where we brought together people with really different skill sets, brought them together and said, all right, here's a problem, how would you tackle that problem? So for example, the six advisors, if you look at the advisors, we have for-profit people, you know, we have like the founder, <laughs> we have, have for-profit people, we have not-for-profit people, we have educators, we have Jewish scholars, we have all those people in the room. And when those six people were analyzing things, the conversation was through the roof through the roof in terms of its quality and the content. How do we bring that to the actual proposal level is something that we're trying to wrestle with. Great, it is a deep, deep pleasure to introduce Lisa Colton as our next speaker. Um, I think many of you know Lisa, I will just say from a personal perspective, um, it takes, there, there's this great, um, there's this great biblical character of Nachshon, you guys know Nachshon, right? Um, diving into the water, diving into the water before the sea splits, before it's clear the sea is gonna split, and saying, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna say, no, you wait, the, the rules of the game are different. I know the rules of the game are different. I don't care if nobody else knows the rules of the game are different, but I do. And Lisa is just that kind of leader who has really moved a conversation uh, for the Jewish community writ large from her, um, from her small perch in, out of Virginia with mag who has magnified that impact far, far beyond just the organization that she runs. So it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.